This is The Red Line, where we interview three geopolitical experts on one big subject shaping the news both here and overseas. And I'm your host, Michael Hilliard. Imagine you've just been elected the leader of a Latin American country. You are now El Presidente. You arrive in your lavish office at 8.30 in the morning and turn to your schedule. 9am is a meeting with the US ambassador. At 9.02, the US ambassador, a stocky man juggling two phones and a manila folder, sits himself down in front of your desk. He immediately launches into his speech and to the topic of China. He projects... You mustn't accept any money from China. China is evil. China is going to debt trap you. China will move in and usurp your country, and you must not take any money. You smile, you nod, but you don't make any commitments. A few minutes later, you politely excuse the ambassador as you have your next meeting. It's now 10 a.m., and the Chinese ambassador walks into your office. Four assistants in tow wearing a fresh pressed suit that would have easily been the most expensive on the rack but totally unsuitable for the humid temperatures of Latin America. After some quick pleasantries, the Chinese ambassador reaches into his briefcase and places four thick binded folders onto the table. The ambassador goes on to say, these are all mega projects approved by the Chinese government, a new airport for one of your regional capitals, a train line connecting your farming district to the ports, an improvement of that port, and a new mine in the north of the country. He then leans back and explains, to make it even easier, all four of them have been funded, costed, and approved. He even has the workers and the companies ready to start construction this month. All you have to do is say yes and sign your name on the dotted line. In your head, you agree that this is a pretty amazing offer, and one that it's pretty hard not to see the benefits of. But you explain that you'll meet with your senior cabinet this afternoon and give them a call this evening. The Chinese ambassador smiles, nods, and exits your office. It's now midday, and you moved into the sprawling 17th century Spanish briefing room at the very end of the building. You enter the room immediately met by the gaze of your senior cabinet, all examining their notes their staff had given them just hours before on the intricacies of the Chinese proposal. You take a position standing over the head of the table and ask your cabinet to give their thoughts. Should your nation take this Chinese deal? The treasurer says, well, the deal would be amazing. It grows next year's GDP by 24%. Your political advisor then says, well, big parts of these projects are inside marginal districts. This deal is your ticket to a second term. Then the foreign secretary chimes in with a slightly more hesitant tone. You see, he's read the transcript from the meeting with the US ambassador this morning. But he grumbles, the US want us to turn this golden ticket away, but what are they offering us? Absolutely nothing. Do the US think we don't have access to the internet, that we don't read the papers, that we don't know what a Chinese debt trap is? We are more than aware. We're not children. This is a great offer and probably a too good an offer to turn down. Not even the IMF would give us a loan of this size. Yes, it'll annoy the US, but I think we should take the loan. The tone of the room changes as people seem to think that this deal is going to go ahead. The only descending vote, your security chief who with the straightforwardness of a man who's been conducting operations on three continents for decades, says, if you go down this road, who knows how the US will react? As much as the Chinese may build our buildings, they won't fight our wars. He's old enough to have seen the US intervention in the Cold War and knows the dirty tricks the US might be willing to play. So, you're the president. What do you do? Do you take the money and invest in real nation building, secure your second term, or do you keep in line with the requests of the military power of the region, one capable of funding and arming your opponents in the next election? This is not a fictitious scenario either. This is actually one described by a Latin American cabinet member, and this scenario is becoming increasingly common in the briefing rooms of Latin American governments. So what should the US do? What should China do? And what are the Latin American countries doing? Well, to take us through all that, we turn to our first guest. Part 1. Much Needed Competition 
Yeah, I mean, that's that's a really critical question. It is a very far region. This has been part of, you know, a debate ongoing uh, among Chinese officials for many years about whether it is indeed worth it, right, to engage extensively with Latin America and the way that China engages with Southeast Asia or other neighboring regions or even Africa, for that matter, which is geographically much, much closer and where there's a much longer standing and productive relationship. But indeed, uh, you know, a lot of the, the materials, pr primary commodities, and especially agricultural ones, we're talking soy, uh, which is absolutely critical to, to China. And, you know, projections suggest that soy consumption in China, not for soy-based uh, you know, products such as tofu, but for, for livestock feed are expected to continue growing well into the future. And so it is critical that China secure markets, um, whether, you know, in nearby or far away, right, to, to have sufficient supply of, of these goods. And in addition to that, as we know, China is interested also in metals and minerals. It has been for two decades now in Latin America and much longer in other places. Margaret Myers is the director of the Asia and Latin America program at the Inter-American Dialogue. Myers, who formerly worked for the US Defense Department, also developed the China Latin America Finance Database, the only publicly available source of empirical data on Chinese state lending in Latin America. And we're thrilled to have it on the program today. Copper fed a lot of China's, you know, infrastructure development at home. It continues to do so to some degree, but a wider range of metals and minerals, many of which are, are located and are available in abundant quantities in Latin America, comparatively speaking, are of interest to China now. Um, that includes things like gold, right, which has technological applications, and especially lithium, uh, which is of critical importance to China as, as well as to other, other countries. When people think of the Belt and Road Initiative, they tend to think of Africa or Southeast Asia. While some BRI projects like Kazakhstan have been relatively successful for China, others like Zambia have been an absolute catastrophe for Beijing. So how does South America compare to China's other BRI projects? You know, it's really difficult to say, and frequently we have to analyze this on a country by country and case by case basis. China has in Africa, just as it does in Latin America, countries where it is embraced, you know, and Chinese companies and other operators are embraced with open arms. Others where they're viewed um, as one of many potential partners, right? And even in some cases, especially in Latin America, with a degree of skepticism. Um, and so, you know, yes, Africa, I think China has made far more inroads in Africa when you compare uh, the sort of multilateral forums that China has established in both regions, the FOCAC in Africa, which is, you know, China's self-created or created alongside Africa platform for engagement at a regional level and the China SELAC forum in, in Latin America, you see that the Africa forum is far more advanced, far more specific, far more effective. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, there uh, there are plenty of examples, I think, in, in both regions of exceedingly productive engagement um, and engagements where, you know, I think Latin American countries and communities that, that are affected would indeed agree that there is some degree of of win-win benefit to use a Chinese phrase, right? Um, but in other cases, you know, plenty of opportunities of failed projects. It is, I am I, unclear to me whether, you know, it's profoundly worse for China in Latin America than it is in Africa, but in the case of Latin America, um, certainly these projects fail for wide ranging reasons. Uh, some of them are, you know, absolutely related to Chinese companies and the way that they're doing business. Allegations of corruption have derailed projects in Panama, for example, quite a few. Um, allegations of corruption elsewhere or efforts to engage directly with national governments uh, at the expense of local communities frequently has also led to considerable protests in the mining sector and elsewhere, which have also derailed projects or at, le or at least, you know, put them in a, in a position of sort of protracted stasis. Um, wherein they are delayed more or less indefinitely. In other cases, we're seeing now mounting opposition to Chinese investment in sectors where it already has a some, somewhat dominant presence and 
uh, where there is something of a national security implication. This includes in the area of electricity generation and transmission, and in some countries in Latin America, uh, certainly China has established a dominant presence in both. And even there are concerns about sort of monopolistic behavior when a you know generation of be it a hydropower facility or otherwise that is run by China is providing electricity to transmission lines that are also owned by and run by China. So these are problems that I think will continue to mount in the region that will attract some growing opposition and will indeed uh, lead to growing concern among certain local populations about the extent of, of dependence on China, not only from an economic perspective, but increasingly as China is invested in very strategic sectors. During the Cold War, we saw South America almost split along a left-right divide, with anti-communist governments getting the strong backing of the United States and communist-aligned ones enjoying the support of the USSR and Cuba. Do you think China will look to create the same sort of ideological divides in South America amongst the countries it funds? Or frankly, Beijing will just do business with whoever as long as it makes Beijing money. There have been a number of, of studies done on this, trying to understand the extent to which China both invests in and provides finance for countries that have varying degrees of, of you know, or levels of, of governance, of corruption, of, you know, of general accountability. Um, all of these measures, you know, or what they've found in general is that um, China, far more than other investors, is inclined to invest in in almost all countries without tremendous regard for levels of corruption or governance, other governance indicators uh, that may dissuade other investors. Um, this is not always the case, and it appears to be shifting somewhat um, as China sort of moves out of places such as Venezuela, which, you know, it's no longer issuing finance in the, in the amounts that it did before or at all. The sorts of oil-backed loans that were characteristic of Chinese finance to the region are no longer um, happening. We see other sort of forms of finance, mostly commercial bank finance for wide-ranging projects, both government projects and private sector ones. Um, and these institutions are potentially a little bit more risk adverse, right, than some of those that were leading the charge in Latin America in years past. So with that in mind, we have seen something of a shift to more engagement in countries with overall, you know, with higher overall credit ratings, with better um, measures of, of uh, in terms of, you know, doing business indicators and uh, levels of corruption and governance and accountability. Um, that said, you know, China is striking deals right now in, in much of Central America, including in, in Nicaragua, which recently cut ties with Taiwan and signed on to the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, it's striking deals still in Venezuela and is a strong supporter of, of Venezuela despite continuing deterioration of conditions there. Um, and so, yes, there is not, I mean, a, at least at face value, particular discrimination, I would say, uh, among countries in Latin America and the Caribbean based on, on governance and other indicators. If what Beijing just wanted was soy and wheat, then Australia is much more geographically closer to them. So with the choice to look all the way over the Pacific at South America, is there an angle that goes beyond just business? Are there strategic choices in tying China into the South American continent's economic prospects? One really critical difference between the way in which the U.S. engages and the way that China engages is that China's companies, not all of them, of course, but both state-owned enterprises and private companies are guided by a set of guidelines and, and regulations that have been in place that, that clearly prioritize China's objectives overseas, whether it concerns the Belt and Road um, or otherwise. And many of these are related to China's own growth prospects at home. So although Xi Jinping is, or Politburo members right, are not directly advising companies on the sorts of deals that they pursue, they are you know, issuing guidelines and, and funneling companies into certain strategic sectors and providing incentive, incentives, financial and otherwise, right, for companies to engage in certain geographical regions and sectors. And many of those objectives, though not all, 
are supportive of either you know government or party priorities in China. It is this is not the case, right, for U.S. investors, um, U.S. companies or European companies for that matter, Australian companies. And so much of what the U.S. is attempting to do now, and it has, you know, sort of prioritized the region to a certain degree through Build Back Better World, which is global in nature, but has been, you know, announced in in certain Latin American countries, um, and through a prioritization of the region in the Development Finance Corporation, for example, um, is to ensure that private companies have sufficient incentives by providing them with finance um, and also helping them to identify projects and in the earliest phases um, so that they are able to to compete and to engage more extensively in the latin american region however you know at present if, if, uh, you know private sector led strategy is a challenging one because it depends on private sector interest and at this particular juncture at a moment of considerable difficulty for latin america as it emerges from the pandemic and you know grapples with the economic and and you know really long lasting as it as it will likely be social effects of the pandemic it's a difficult sell for many in the private sector, which view, you know, growing levels of risk in many countries in Latin America, including those that used to be viewed as more or less safe bets, right? The Chile, for example, or, or others where, you know, leadership transitions, although it's still not clear what the policies will look like, may lead to a more difficult investment environment in certain specific sectors. And so this is what, I mean, fundamentally the challenge is that, you know, these are very different models of engagement and um, the sort of state-led drive, uh, you know, to engage more extensively in Latin America of the sort that we see coming out of China is going to lead inevitably to just more funds and more activity. And it's not just a drive in the, in the economic realm, right? It's accompanied by an extensive effort uh, on the part of Chinese government entities, quasi-governmental entities, corporations, private and public, um, sister, and, sister cities and provincial networks that have been long-lasting and well-established, friendship groups, really you name it, wide-ranging actors to develop ties that may eventually or you know now or into the future be productive in, in a commercial sense or even in terms of inv- advancing some of China's political interests. So can you take us through a real example of this? And for that example, let's talk about Argentina because I know you've done a lot of work on this subject. Argentina has been on the brink of economic collapse for a long time now, taking multiple bailouts over the years. For one of the Argentinian projects, though, they've asked the US, the IMF, and just about everyone else for money to fund the extension of the Belgrano Rail Network between the fertile and mineral-rich areas in the north of the country to the ports in the east. Whilst all the other countries said no and refused to fund it, China has swooped in and funded this project. So, first of all, why would China fund this project for a country that has defaulted a number of times? And can Argentina really be blamed for taking Chinese money when no one else would actually fund them? The most important thing to understand about Chinese investment in transport infrastructure in Latin America and other regions is it's not just motivated by, uh, you know, bottom line calculations of of profit and and, and bankability and and project sustainability, right? Um, There are a lot of other motivating factors that have, you know, led a number of different companies and indeed the Chinese government to focus on on infrastructure development overseas and were largely the impetus for the development, the creation of the Belt and Road Initiative back in 2013 in its most incipient form. And some of some of this is related, you know, again, as we spoke about before, to trade. Uh, to trade in primary commodities, uh, soy, for example, and other minerals, metals, you know, uh, um, an extractive sector products. And if we look at, you know, Belgrano Cargas and other rail in that area, a lot of that is intended uh, to help to carry soy and other products right to port. Um, 
uh, or, you know, to connect then to rail projects that are being developed in other countries to then take these products to port. Um, some of this is happening on the Atlantic coast of Latin America. Some of this is happening on the Pacific coast of Latin America. And the Pacific coast has in many ways been prioritized. If you look at a map of all of the deals that are being struck, port port projects and, and rail and road, a lot of it's leading to the Pacific because the Pacific is really quite critical in terms of, you know, avoiding major conflict, potential conflict zones, hot spots um, when shipping primary commodities and other goods to China. Uh, it avoids the Gulf of Aden, it avoids the South China Sea, and these are all potentially contentious areas uh, that could disrupt the flows of uh, or, or transport of certain goods. Uh, so transport security, certainly trade facilitation are major motivating factors. Another really critical motivating factor is China's own sort of imbalances in its economy that are brought about by, um, you know, a, a state-led model and that have resulted in considerable, you know, overcapacity in, in certain state-run sectors, including the steel sector. China has extensive overcapacity in steel and has been looking um, to export that. And this is a big part of the sorts of deals that are being struck around the world. So if you look at the Belgrano Cargas, to get back to your question, deal, a lot of that requires the use of Chinese materials, even though Argentina may produce some of these things. So the materials, you know, used in the rail construction itself, and then the companies doing the construction are, you know, at least in part and a very large part, um, Argent uh, excuse me, Chinese rather than Argentine. Um, and so this, I mean, you know, exportation of ex cap excess capacity, whether in terms of labor or supplies, goods, is continues to be and has been for many years a motivating factor in a lot of this. So it's important for us to understand that, um, you know, China's calculations go, go way beyond, uh, you know, simply profit-based motivations. Do you think this is the precursor to a almost fracturing of the South American continent where we have certain countries who are funded and more aligned with the United States and others who will be closer politically and economically to China? It's, uh, I mean, China is interested in achieving wide ranging economic objectives in Latin America. And indeed, you know, this is their priority. And there's a certain urgency, right, in, in terms of the way that China is engaging the region, because if it does not uh, become a dominant player in, you know, technology, in advanced technology, and in certain other sort of innovation related sectors, then it will not escape the middle income trap and will not continue to grow at the rates that it is growing right now. And that will be a critical problem for China and China's leadership in the coming years. Um, so absolutely, I think I mean, I, this quote absolutely resonates. You know, when China approaches the region, it approaches with investment in mind, in part because, uh, you know, it's 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 of existential importance that some of these these investments um, are achieved um, or signed. And uh, so when and I would agree absolutely that when the U.S., you know, engages the region increasingly, you know, there has been a focus on investment. There has been a focus on, you know, attempting to have productive conversations about U.S. policy and U.S. cooperation with Latin America on wide ranging matters of shared interest. Um, but yes, I mean, the, not only is China mentioned frequently, but the, the region continues to be characterized in many ways, including in U.S. formal policy documents as, as problematic, right? Focusing on uh, migration and other challenges that, that, that are seen as a problem rather than focusing on opportunities for, for regional collaboration and for a hemispheric agenda. And so it is incumbent upon the U.S. to engage more productively, more positively with the region and with a, a very clear strategy um, for regional and hemispheric cooperation in mind. Whether there's a fracturing or not uh, is unclear to me. I don't know that that's China's intent, uh, but certainly, you know, already we see China's influence in really profound ways in much of South America in particular, in part because China is such an important trade partner for these countries, that decisions 
have to be made in many cases with, with China's interests in mind. And very few governments, especially national governments, right, are, are willing to risk a setback in what is a critically important trade relationship, especially at this juncture, right, um, uh, by, by going against China or by characterizing China or Chinese activities uh, within its own borders or externally in a negative light. Um, and so the influence and the fracturing may already be underway. The Cold War saw a number of communist as well as right-wing governments rise up inside South America. And whilst the US directly toppled some, other governments remained staunchly anti-US for decades. To combat communism in what the US saw as its own backyard, sometimes they would use a light touch by just producing the trade between the two countries, something economically disastrous when the US is the largest economy in the region. Other times, the US would support rebel groups to overthrow the communist government and install US-backed right-wing juntas. But on a few occasions, like in Grenada, the US would launch a full-scale invasion of the country to prevent a communist-aligned government coming to power. And that was the Cold War, though. The US wouldn't do that anymore, would they? Would the US actually dust off their old playbooks as countries begin to get a bit too cozy with China? Does Washington still adhere to the principles of the Monroe Doctrine. Well, to answer that, we turn to our second guest. Part two, the same old offer. The Monroe Doctrine has always been misunderstood because at the time that it was put out, it was the United States uh, seeking to stand in solidarity with Latin American states against European interventionism, remembering that the United States itself, not too long before that Monroe Doctrine had not only won its independence from Great Britain, but was dealing with um, Great Britain with respect to the, the War of 1812, with which it drew to a to a draw. Um, however, uh, I was actually there when um, the former Secretary of State uh, declared in front of the Organization of American States too much applause that um, the United States was walking away from the, so to speak, Monroe Doctrine. But in a sense, the Monroe Doctrine has always been more than anything else, a symbol in the region of what they see as U.S. interventionism and the U.S. trying to impose its thoughts and will, um, which you know has at some points or not corresponded to historical reality. Um, I certainly uh, will say that when we look at issues such as uh, Chinese activities in the region and Russian activities in the, in the region, um, there certainly are legitimate sources of concern, um, not because the United States is trying to impose a will on the region, but because the United States is intimately connected in terms of its security and its prosperity to what happens in the region um, by ties of geography, by ties of family, by ties of commerce. Uh, of course, uh, Latin America is the largest uh, trade partner uh, that we have, even more than China. Uh, Latin America is the largest source of uh, overseas uh, U.S. investment at the moment. As we see with very contentious issues in the United States, such as immigration and drugs, which killed over 100,000 people in the United States, what happens in Latin America, the governance uh, in the region, our ability to cooperate with the region directly impacts uh, Americans and um, our, our domestic situation here. Evan Ellis is a research professor of Latin American studies at the U.S. Army War College Strategic Studies Institute, with a focus on the region's relationships with China and other non-Western Hemisphere actors. Evan has published over 280 works on China in Latin America, and previously served as the Secretary of State's policy planning staff with the responsibility to Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as the International Narcotics and Law Enforcement Committee. And we're thrilled to have him back on the program today. China is looking for the th things that it needs for its economic prosperity and security in all parts of the world, not just Latin America. We've seen that as China's appetite for everything from foodstuffs to uh, petroleum to fuel uh, China's manufacturing base to uh, materials, metals for capital formation um, have all grown exponentially with the Chinese economy and its activities. In the same sense, uh, China's uh, search for markets doesn't just extend to Latin America, but also includes Europe, it includes East. Eastern Europe, it includes Africa and, and all of the reaches of the world. So indeed, in many ways, uh, China's uh, outreach to Latin America has 
actually followed uh, its engagement with many other parts of the world. But what you see is that in Latin America, like other places, there are a number of different things that China finds that it does need. So given China's need to feed its 1.4 million people um, as a complement to foodstuffs that it can acquire in Africa and Asia and other places, it finds that, for example, uh, Argentina and Brazil are uh, very uh, good sources of, for example, soybeans, as well as increasingly um, uh, beef and, and other products. Uh, China finds that uh, the middle class Latin American uh, cities and and uh, countries more broadly are very good markets uh, as it uh, advances with respect to to autos it, it, construction and construction services and, and various other things and including uh, electronics uh, Latin America is one place as part of a broader global march uh, to try to uh, take a key role in technologies which goes into setting the standards and advancing its position globally in in those technologies I, I would say that it's not particularly Latin America but China's uh, search for different things in, in Latin America is really an extension of that broader global expansion. Now, certainly, uh, China has um, some strategic interests. Uh, number one, it's uh, it finds that uh, a significant number of the states which continue to recognize Taiwan, which of course it wishes to isolate, are found in Central America and the Caribbean, as well as uh, Paraguay in, in South America. Um, China recognizes also that just as it wishes to dominate the Southeast maritime approaches to China, the first island chain um, in that space through its militarization of reefs and shoals and um, you know, the assertion of, of control over things like the, the Nine Dash Line, its extension uh, militarily into the Pacific through the um, you know, the new project with, with the Solomon Islands. Um, in that same sense, China also sees the Southeast maritime approach to the United States, which is the Caribbean, as a similar space um, in which uh, it is a logistics hub for the United States. Um, it is uh, of military significance. And so China does have a special interest in wanting to be there while doing so at the same time without alarming the United States. So I would say that uh, this is not unique what China is doing in Latin America, but it has probably gathered a lot of attention in Washington really over the 20 years that I followed it because it is indeed so close uh, to the United States and so directly impacts uh, U.S. equities. People are bringing up this subject quite a lot recently, with the U.S. finally looking to create a key strategy for countering Chinese influence in the region. But is this really a recent issue? Or is it one that's been quietly creeping in now for 20 years? Well, I would say that the attention on China's growth in Latin America never really left. It has come in waves and starts. So I, for example, watched uh, the increasing concern and discomfort with both Republican and Democratic uh, leaders over, over the years. I remember uh, people like Assistant Secretary of, of State Arturo Valenzuela, uh, later uh, Assistant Secretary of State Roberta Jacobson, um, and of course, uh, as we re recall, um, Assistant Secretary uh, um, Secretary of State Rex Tillerson and, and uh, certainly uh, Mike Pompeo during the Trump administration, um, each expressing uh, concerns. Um, of course, the actual amount of Chinese investment uh, continued to grow. The uh, amount of, of China's physical presence on the ground um, grew especially exponentially after 2010. Uh, in certain sectors, uh, such as digital technologies, I think the implications of that growing Chinese architecture and surveillance systems uh, became particularly noticeable in the, um, you know, after about 2015, 2016. Um, and again, that has continued to grow. So on the one hand, um, you have kind of this expansion and a continuing kind of reaction and, and redefinition in Washington of, of how do we understand this and, and are we concerned about it? Um, you also have uh, different policymakers, which of course take different uh, attitudes, uh, just as actually has happened in Australia with uh, China's expansion engagement uh, there. So of course, uh, you know, notably uh, with the incoming uh, administration of, of Donald Trump in, in 2016, 2017, uh, you had a shift in the level to which it, China was seen as a concern with the naming of China in the 2017 national security strategy as a competitor against which we needed to push back. Um, and I think in many ways, what's happened in the Biden administration now um, is especially with people such as uh, as Kirk Campbell, uh, you know, really coordinating some of the thinking about uh, China uh, in, in Asia and, and other uh, key players, and certainly the, the knowledge of uh, Secretary Blinken and uh, you know, especially the repercussions of, of what happened after the uh, very difficult Anchorage summit, is that um, there's a sense uh, that the growing threat 
requires uh, various types of, of measures to respond. And the question is how, not necessarily how do we uh, exclude China from the region, but how do we more effectively uh, compete against the region? Um, and of course, uh, other actors, I think, have magnified the uh, threat that uh, China has, has posed. And so on the one hand, as we've seen the proliferation of non-democratic states in Latin America, particularly those who have been funded uh, indirectly by Chinese money. So we can talk about the survival of the uh, Hugo Chavez regime in Venezuela. We can talk about uh, the um, the advance of the Rafael Correa regime in, in Ecuador uh, from 2006 uh, you know, during that time. We can talk about um, you know, Ecuador. Um, we can talk about Bolivia with Evo Morales. Um, we can talk about Argentina right now, which again has a myriad of, of different uh, Chinese projects. So, so I think uh, that has caused a, a certain level of discomfort. And, and certainly in Beijing, um, when uh, Vladimir Putin, shortly before his unprovoked invasion of the Ukraine, um, met with President Xi and the two put out that very strong statement uh, talking about um, the uh, you know, rejecting uh, a U.S. concept of, of democracy and, and, and human rights, uh, trying to draw a moral equivalence, and uh, talking about the post-World War II um, boundaries, which was a time in which, of course, uh, China was dominant in Asia and Russia had its, its troops uh, across East, Eastern Europe um, shortly before we saw Russia beginning a process to try to do that again. I think all of those types of behaviors have set out there um, that uh, China is a, a, a serious challenge in a number of different ways. And so I, I think that's continued to augment the pressure and augment thinking about how do we respond effectively to this challenge. So how far will China's position on the continent grow? Do you think we're likely to see Chinese bases or resupply hubs in South America going forward over the next few years? Well, certainly right now, and by right now, I mean uh, this decade and, and perhaps for another decade or two to come, uh, China is clearly deferential to the United States in what it perceives as our near abroad. Um, it does certain things. I mean, it does military engagement in the Caribbean. Um, for example, um, it's uh, sent its hospital ship Peace Arc to the Caribbean three times in the, in the past decade with multiple uh, stops. It's participated with its military police in United Nations peacekeeping operations uh, in um, in in Haiti for eight years. Um, most of the senior defense and constabulary force or police officials in the Caribbean states have been over to China on different leadership visits. Uh, so you actually have, and you, uh, the Caribbean states have received any number of, of gifts of, of military construction equipment, police vehicles and motorcycles and various different things. So the Chinese actually have been very active, but in terms of a physical base, whether it's in La Union and El Salvador or, or Panama, um, on the one hand, China is physically not in a position militarily with the position of the PLA to be able to logistically, um, and in terms of its size, defend uh, such a base right now. Um, it's also, it would be a costly and provocative thing that would undermine uh, China's narrative about being a, a, a peaceful actor with win-win commercial relationships in the Western Hemisphere close to the United States. However, what you do see is that empirically, as Chinese economic power and as China's confidence and especially that of its leadership under this uh, Xi Jinping regime has grown, uh, you've seen a growth of Chinese military power and aggressiveness with it. And so specifically, I would call out the way in which uh, in Asia itself, as, as China has, has grown, you've had the assertiveness with the Nine Dash Line um, and uh, stepping over some of the um, you know, findings of, of UNCLOS with respect to uh, China's uh, territorial claims. You've had the militarization of those reefs and shoals in the South and East China Sea. Um, you Little by little, you've seen uh, the PLA start to do out-of-area operations, um, first just counter-piracy operations in the Indian Ocean and beyond off the coast of Somalia. And then, of course, you saw that the base in Djibouti, and then, um, you know, which again uh, projects uh, power um, uh, to uh, you know, allow China to have influence over that critical uh, choke point, which is the, the Suez Canal. And then, of course, talks of a possible base uh, in negotiations on the Atlantic, uh, the western coast of Africa. And, of course, uh, now you see in, in the Solomon Islands. Um, and, uh, you know, again, these security advances in Asia are, are something that uh, certainly Australia has seen very much. And, and, indeed, just in the same way that Australia being much closer to China has also seen um, the aggressiveness, the way in which uh, China responded with uh, cutoffs of 
of um, economic relationships when the Australian government dared to, uh, you know, question the you know, Wuhan origins of the uh, the coronavirus. So I think little by little, even in Latin America, you're beginning to see um, you know some of the wolf warrior diplomats in, in places like like Chile or Venezuela or or, or Grenada. Um, so clearly there is a process where as that Chinese power and self confidence grows, um, it, it's not that China is not acting aggressively or even militarily in in Latin America um, at any time. It's that um, it is not at that point yet while it continues uh, to to consolidate its power and, and expand its influence. The U.S. would be considered by most to be the current hegemon of much of Central America. But recently we saw Panama switch its recognition from Taiwan to the PRC, only giving the U.S. three hours notice before announcing the decision. Do you think the U.S. has lost a lot of its sway in the region if formerly very close allies like the Panama are willing to make big decisions like that without consulting the United States. The power that the possibility of doing business with China inspires in many of our Latin American uh, partners, uh, including those who are closest to us. We long considered because of our uh, close relationship with Panama, where we actually had a U.S. Southern Command and um, a number of uh, U.S. Uh, expats, that that closeness of the relation meant that uh, China would never do something so bold as to change relations. And again, Ambassador Feely, who I think was probably one of our you know just top ambassadors uh, in in the region, uh, I know that was uh, you know probably a a, a bit of a a a, a, a slap uh, to to him when uh, President. Varela did that. Um, but in the same token, when we often reassure ourselves of our good relations with, with other partners, uh, you know, the closeness that we always have, for example, with El Salvador and the way in which literally four days after um, uh, Secretary Pompeo at the time met with uh, Salvador's new president, Nayib Bukele, uh, talking about the closeness of the relationship, praising him. Uh, Bukele went over to China and, uh, you know, accepted $500 million of, of promises for, 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 for new goodies. And so I, I think what you're seeing is again that that power of China's desire to to do things in, in the way in which uh, that impacts relationships and, and leaders in, in ways that generate really surprises. At the same time, China also doesn't get too involved in the local politics if they can avoid it. I found it very interesting a few years ago when Xi was meant to attend a conference of Latin American states, one that was also supposed to be attended by Chinese ally and Venezuelan president Nicolas Maduro. But when China found out that US-backed Venezuelan opposition leader Juan Guaido would also be attending, Xi pulled out, with many speculating that he did so, so he didn't have to pick a side or shake one hand over another. Obviously, China has put a lot of investment towards the Maduro government, so why shy away from a big photo op like this? Well, the China-Venezuela relationship is in many ways, uh, much like the China-North Korea relationship with Kim Jong-un. Um, on the one hand, um, you know, China has had a lot of headaches and it doesn't want to get implicated in um, the policies of the Maduro regime, whether it's uh, its uh, criminality or its aggressiveness uh, against uh, the United States and democratic actors uh, in, in the region. Um, but at the same time, China does not want to abandon a friend, and China strategically benefits from the uh, actions that Venezuela has taken um, uh, throughout the region and the way in which uh, that prevents the United States from having a, a more uh, solid uh, foothold uh, in, in the region with, with a number of, of different players. In, in the same way also that China benefits from Russia's aggression as that diverts and distracts the West, uh, uh, specifically Ukraine, uh, so long as China does not get implicated in its own relationships um, with respect to what its partner Russia is, is doing. The Venezuela relationship has also gone through a series of, of phases for China. Um, in the mid 2000s, uh, I think a number of Chinese companies and banks jumped into Venezuela very quickly because they understood that um, the China Venezuela relationship had the blessing of the Chinese state. There was a political affinity by the then Hugo Chavez regime. Venezuela had a lot of money and it was sitting on a lot of oil. And so they structured deals in an intelligent way to make sure that China would get paid even if Venezuela was defaulting on other loans, the, the famous uh, loans for oil parallel contracts. Um, however, 
Venezuela did end up being a nightmare for the Chinese. The levels of corruption, the levels of inefficiency meant that a lot of Chinese projects uh, actually were never completed. The Chinese still got paid, things like the Tanakal uh, Railroad. Um, however, it, it just, um, you know, the Chinese did not come away with it with any successes that they could show the rest of the world. Uh, Venezuela also became a very violent place. Uh, there were uh, you know, many different actions uh, against uh, you know, Chinese shopkeepers as well as Chinese Chinese business persons in the greater Caracas area. So as things began to fall apart, um, the Chinese really largely fled. And um, when a lot of, uh, when Venezuela began to run out of money um, and as international sanctions, especially U.S. sanctions were opposed uh, against it, uh, really deepening in 2019 and in 2020 uh, with uh, the, the naming of, of Juan Guaido as the de jure uh, president, uh, according to the way things played out with the Constitution. Um, as, you, uh, as you had that pushback, uh, China initially really did try to at least not get caught up in U.S. sanctions in the way that, that Russia did. Um, it uh, initially at least formally stopped taking deliveries on Venezuela oil and oil, which could have been subject to sanctions, because China recognized that those companies, CNPC and, and others, had a lot of exposure in international markets uh, that could be hurt um, if it was, uh, it just wasn't worth it uh, for it to take delivery um, on that oil, which could uh, lead it to, to problems. And so, again, China has played to the extent that it could in that. Um, the United States, uh, certainly there's been outreach by Juan Guaido uh, to, to the Chinese, um, at least a cautious dialogue. I, I've heard that actually from some of Guaido's people. Uh, you've had uh, the Chinese um, trying to avoid responding to invitations from the United States, I, I think, to be more aggressive and more helpful. I mean, China could play a key role in, you know, political transition in Venezuela with the Maduro regime tomorrow if it really wanted to do that. But again, um, you know, China has found it beneficial to have that friend and and, and everything that the Venezuela's uh, continuing existence implies for the region as long as it doesn't cause too many problems uh, for China um you also saw an interesting uh, situation in in which uh, for a while on an unofficial basis um there were a number of small chinese uh uh, shipping companies and, and other organizations that found that they could start uh, evading sanctions by doing ship-to-ship -ship, uh, transfers of Venezuelan oil off of the the coast of of Malaysia. Um, and it was interesting that you actually saw a, a quiet action about a year ago where the Chinese um, state, uh, through a new taxation policy and I think some some uh, some political guidance really put an end to that kind of unauthorized privateering. And it wasn't that they were trying to bring down the Maduro regime, more that the Chinese wanted to make sure that these kind of unauthorized actions did not get their companies in trouble. And so I think, again, what you see is that China is in no hurry to help the United States resolve this mess in Venezuela, which distracts the United States and, and undercuts um, the U.S. Uh, position in the region. However, um, China is cautious not to go along with that regime so far as that it causes problems for China with its reputation, with other allies, with other partners in, in other parts of the world. So I, I think that's the tricky balance that China continues to maintain here, um, very much like the tricky balance it tries to maintain its position with, with Russia, not being implicated in Russian invasion of the Ukraine, but not abandoning Russia and Putin as a partner, uh, even as things get really ugly in the Ukraine. We're starting to see China scale back some of their BRI projects overseas in places like Zambia after losing lots and lots of money. If the investments in South America start going badly, do you think China will also abandon South America? Or is it worth China losing money in South America in order to maintain their strategic position on the continent? Well, certainly in uh, Central Asia, in Africa and elsewhere, uh, China's advances uh, through BRI have been limited by economic realities. Um, so, um, you know, with uh, some of the core Belt and Road projects, uh, almost a trillion dollars, as you know, uh, was uh, put in. Um, but a lot of that was also uh, Chinese banks with a lot of money to lend, finding that the projects were blessed for being part of the BRI. Uh, Chinese construction companies interested in actually having that work. And so uh, there was a lot of, of push there. And then uh, in many places in the world, um, those uh, projects, which were never particularly commercially viable in, in, in the first place, began to run into problems as well as uh, 
problems in terms of, of the details of their their implementation. And so um, you're very right. As as China has had those problems, it's found itself in debt overreach, uh, things that it had built that do not necessarily make any, any sense, um, especially with uh, the current difficulties with COVID-19 um, and the effects on the world economy um, and um, some of the really attention to the Chinese debt overhang that you've gotten from the Evergrande crisis, for example, or uh, to the degree that you've gotten it from some of the anti-corruption pushback by um, President Xi Jinping, uh, not only what began with Bo Xilai, but what is really ex extended um, in, in in recent years. And so I think all of those areas of, of push have caused China globally to be a little bit more cautious about its projects, to rethink its projects. Um, it hasn't really backed away, but it has been more cautious. And certainly in Latin America, you see similar tendencies. There's been, uh, at least for the moment with, with COVID and, and other things, a, a slowdown in those projects going forward. Um, and indeed, you can always talk about a difference between kind of some of the big ticket projects, which sound good, but never really made sense. I mean, the Bayushenik uh, Railroad, the $10 billion project that was going to connect Brazil and Peru, or of course the Nicaragua Canal, which is never really an official Chinese project, but really the 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 dream of you know one particular you know Chinese uh, you know billionaire Wang Jing. But uh, you actually see in Latin America that some of the the smaller projects um, have gone forward. Um, so you see, for example, the Bogota Metro, a four point five five billion dollar uh, project there. The um, the uh, PPP, uh, public-private partnership project, building a highway from um, from Medellin up to the Gulf of Uraba in Colombia, um, Highway 5 in, in Chile, um, the modernization of the Belgrano rail, uh, cargo cell rail system across Argentina. Um, so you actually do see a lot of things uh, that make sense by China that are indeed slowly going forward. But it's absolutely important to recognize that um, those other things out there, the, the debt overhang, the anti-corruption rollback, um, the economic pressures um, have slowed things down a little bit and I think have, have certainly put a pause on some of the projects that, that didn't make a lot of sense. And so I think we're continuing to kind of work through that mixture of incentives right now in, in Latin America, just like in other parts of the world. So if more and more countries in Latin America are starting to take loans from China, what should the US be doing? Should the US just accept that they don't own South America and let China gain more and more influence in their key strategic areas of interest? Should the US and China start competing in the region, both bidding against one another to build that new school in Bogota? Well, that sounds great for Latin Americans, but I don't think it sounds too great for the US budget. Or should the US look to stamp this out now and bring back a doctrine dreamed up in 1823? Well, to answer that, we do to our final guest. Part three, right under our noses. I guess in tackling this first question, I think we have to look at the way that China is using its power in South and Central America. And I would offer that China is prioritizing a soft power arsenal and engaging with Latin America and the Caribbean. Beijing is very much interested in shaping its image as an important superpower, and it's focused on economic and diplomatic expansion in the region. On the economic side, China entered the 21st century with impressive GDP growth, a preeminent position in global supply chains, and a growing middle class. And to sustain its performance and to prevent disquiet at home, China was forced to find new partners and new markets. Latin America was a land of opportunity. It had previously been, for the most part, untapped by Beijing, and it was a region that was that is awash in natural resources. And so in 2004, China became a permanent observer to the Organization of American States. In 2009, China joined the Inter-American Development Bank. And in the past decade, 21 countries across Latin America and the Caribbean have signed up for China's Belt and Road Initiative. Over this period of past 20 years or so, we've also seen trade in the region surge, growing from $18 billion a year in 2002 to 450 billion dollars just last year and president xi in 2015 set a target of 500 billion dollars of trade value for the year of 2025 which it seems like latin america and the caribbean and, and china are on on track to to meet paul angelo is a fellow for latin america studies at the council on foreign relations his work focuses on u.s latin america relations transnational crime violent actors 
military and police reform, as well as immigration. He's also a former active duty naval officer, and Paul has an extensive experience in military and government service throughout the region. And we're thrilled to have him on the program today. I mean, at this point, I would just offer that that China's main aim on, on, on the diplomatic front and main objective is, is the isolation of Taiwan. Seven of the 13 countries of the world that still recognize Taiwan are in Latin America and the Caribbean. And in the past five years, we've seen a reversal of four other countries in the region under recognition of Taiwan in favor of a one China policy. And I think more than anything, China is trying to lay a diplomatic groundwork to entice the remainder of these countries into an acceptance of one China policy and is doing so through uh, major investments and diplomatic overtures. Well, many of the nations that still do hold on to their recognition of Taiwan do so at the behest of the United States. But as we saw with Panama switching its allegiance without consulting the United States, do you think there will be other nations who will seek the money that China will be offering them and be abandoning their recognition of Taiwan? Yeah, I think in the case of Panama, we really shouldn't be surprised that it happened. I think there was a lot of, of, of media coverage of you know that quick turnaround, but frankly, Panama's decision came after more than a decade of deepening economic support from Beijing. China was simply willing to outspend Taiwan and the United States on investments that Panama was, was desperate to attract, including a project to expand the Panama Canal and enhance logistics infrastructure to capture increased trade or value-added production along the Panama Canal. Uh, and, and so, uh, you know, it, it didn't surprise me, frankly, when, when, when that declaration was made. Um, that it sort of was a natural outgrowth of deepening economic cooperation uh, and deepening Chinese investment in Panama uh, over the preceding decade. Uh, and if you look at the other countries that were sort of part of that same cohort or have been part of that same cohort, Dominican Republic, El Salvador, Nicaragua, um, these are all countries that reversed recognition of, of Taiwan uh, in the past five years. I think in every case, there was also a real sovereignty consideration and leaders in every country sort of left asking themselves, why should they miss out on the economic benefits of a relationship with China when a country like the United States has enjoyed deepening economic ties with China for decades? Um, and so I, I think in, in many ways, this was these are decisions that were intended to stake out sort of an independent course uh, for these nations that conferred upon them and their people some pretty significant economic opportunities um, that, that they felt that they would have been otherwise missing out on. Well, which countries do you think would be the most likely to be next to flip their recognition from Taiwan to the PRC? You know, I, I think the one one country where we might see some churn is Honduras. I just came back from a trip to Honduras, and Honduras's new president, Xiomara Castro, expressed a campaign intention to reverse course and recognize one China policy. However, at this particular juncture, and Honduras remains a significant point of investment for the Biden administration and a priority country for engagement on attempting to address the root causes of migration from Central America. And so I, I suspect that in, in order not to upset the United States, I suspect that President Castro will try to slow roll any such decision making on the issue of Taiwan. And in fact, uh, the Taiwanese president was invited to her inauguration in January, which goes to show just how quickly uh, she was she she tried, she reversed course at least rhetorically uh, on the issue of China Taiwan, um, but I do think that if there were to be a country that 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 might make that decision in the years to come, it would it would most likely be Honduras because of the president's previously stated intention of doing so. Um, but elsewhere, be it you know Belize, Haiti, Guatemala, Paraguay, I, I don't really see any imminent pivots, and and if. It is to happen. I think there will probably some, be some significant signs that would, would let us know uh, that this is the, the direction in which any number of these countries would be moving. Something that always rings in my mind discussing this subject is a statement from the Chilean ambassador. He said, when the US comes to my office, all they talk about is China, China, China. But when the Chinese come to my office, all they want to talk about is infrastructure. It's a statement also expressed by numerous Latin American officials all across the continent. So should the U.S. be changing tact, and is there the appetite in the states to try and match the Chinese for funding in this region of the world? Regrettably, I'd say that complacency is a big part of the reason why the United States hasn't prioritized Latin America and the Caribbean, despite our obvious mutual interest and our geographic proximity. Following the Cold War, the United States was able to corral regional consensus 
across the hemisphere on things like democratic governance, free trade, and counter-narcotics without too much trouble because we didn't have any near-peer competitors operating in the region. And so attention, resources, and goods from the United States flowed so long as governments across Latin America and the Caribbean embraced U.S. preferences. We saw a rupture in this model, however, during the pink tide in the early 2000s. This is the time of Latin American history in which we saw leftist or center-left governments taking hold across the region. Um, they were democratically elected and, and in some cases um, sort of subverted democratic norms and, and, and fell out of favor with the United States government. But it, it was a period in Latin American history in which I think hemispheric relations really have never recovered. And it was also during this period where China began to make its case to the Americas. Um, this was facilitated or accelerated, frankly, after the 2008 recession, uh, which hit Latin America especially hard and shattered faith in U.S. leadership, or at least in, in U.S.'s management of, of its markets. And the one country that was there to help Latin America and the Caribbean rebound after the 2008 recession was China. Um, and, and it did so through investment and through uh, exports and particularly the consumption of uh, the country's energy, excuse me, the region's energy resources. I, I would say another factor in this, right, frankly, on the U.S. side is that we've in the past five to ten years seen a breakdown of support for free trade among Republicans and Democrats alike. And that fuels the perception that the United States isn't as reliable an economic partner as it was once thought to be. And I think the withdrawal of the United States from the Trans-Pacific Partnership and Trump's tariffs and trade war are emblematic of the hostile signals that Washington was sending. Meanwhile, China is, is offering, as you said, infrastructure and uh, investment. And this was, you know, I, I'm not seeing a whole lot of churn, frankly, here in Washington, D.C. to make investments and, and the prioritization of export markets in Latin America a top line agenda item uh, for policymakers. And so I think that that more than anything helps explain uh, why uh, China is, is, is seizing the moment and, and looking for increased opportunity in Latin America and the Caribbean. So one proposal put forward on this was by U.S. Senator Marco Rubio. But in contrast to China, Rubio's proposal was calling for private business to be the one to invest into projects in Latin America. Is this the beginning of the U.S. counter strategy and actually feasible, or is it just Marco Rubio courting the Latin American vote in Southern Florida before 2024? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's, there's been a lot of rhetoric on both sides of the aisle in Washington, D.C. about the Build Act or Build Back Better World. Um, the use of the Development Finance Corporation as a way of stimulating U.S. investment in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, but frankly, we haven't really seen any proof of concept in the region for, for any of these initiatives. Uh, Build Back Better World has yet to take off. The Development Finance Corporation, which was largely meant to be a response from the United States to China's Belt and Road Initiative, doesn't really have a, any sort of pilot project in Latin America that you can point to to say that oh, this, is a, this is a good example of public-private investment on part of the United States in the region. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that there's, there's you know, a, a real missed opportunity there. The United States has yet to make its case in this regard. China has built some facilities on the continent so far, including a space facility in Argentina, that's guarded by Chinese, and China refuses to elaborate on what exactly it's there for. Do you think China will seek to expand or set up formal bases elsewhere on the South American continent, seeing as the wind seems to be in their sails? That's a, that's a good question. I mean, I think China has already made this play in, in Africa, in Djibouti, and I think increasingly in Equatorial Guinea, there are, there are rumors that, that China is seeking to militarize or, or, or build military facilities in, in, in Bata, in Equatorial Guinea. Um, but we aren't yet seeing this kind of antagonism in the Western Hemisphere. And I think, frankly, that is owed to the fact that on the security front, China is seeking to avoid provocation, perhaps as a way of modeling great power conduct for the United States, which maintains an unmistakably large military presence in China's own neighborhood in East Asia. So to this end, I think China has deliberately tried to avoid formal military alliances and engages in exchanges with militaries and police across the, the region 
in ways that do not exclude any third parties. There are opportunities for the United States to, to, to join in on these security cooperation activities if the United States so chose to do. Um, I do think from a U.S. side perspective and the national security realm, the concern, frankly, is the possibility of dual-use facilities. That is, Chinese commercial infrastructure that could later be militarized to defend or advance China's own geostrategic posture. And, you know, here I think we're talking about the possibility of using commercial facilities like ports or, for instance, a space station in Argentina, Espacio Lejano, the Panama Canal Zone, where China and Chinese firms have significant concessions and free trade zones uh, to disrupt commercial or naval access. If China wants to build a naval base in a smaller nation like Trinidad or Suriname, do you think that would be a red line for the US? And they would go down the same road as they did with Grenada with a short, sharp invasion of the country. I think that would depend in large part on who's sitting in the Oval Office at the time that that would happen. But frankly, I don't see that as being an imminent threat necessarily. And I, I do think that militarization of China's strategy within the region in any capacity would be a red line. But I think the most likely flashpoint would actually be the deployment of paramilitary boats or ships to protect Chinese fishing fleets, which are operating largely in an illegal, unreported, and unregulated capacity in the Eastern Pacific um, and contributing to depletion of the fish stocks in the coastal waters of places like Peru and Chile and Ecuador. So the U.S. is largely involved in the anti-narcotics fight inside South America. If China wants to get more invested in the continent, do you think they would also be looking to combat narcotics in the region or frankly, the more drugs that gets into the U.S., the better it is for China. We've seen recently China's use of anti-narcotics as a rhetorical device to justify security cooperation activities in Latin America and the Caribbean. However, I think that if China is serious about playing a major anti-narcotics role, then it should refocus its energies on preventing the export of fentanyl or similar precursor chemicals for the production of synthetic opioids to the region. The recent report from the United States indicates that the leading cause of death for 18 to 45 year olds in the United States is now fentanyl overdoses. And the DEA has insisted that China is not sharing data on exports of chemicals, even to Mexico, which has become the top fentanyl supplier to the United States. China has also not acted on US indictments of Chinese drug traffickers. And I think this overall just points to a refusal to cooperate and enforce the, the, the law. Um, and, and it's doing so in a way that, that contributes to record levels of, of violence, cartel violence in, in Mexico, um, and an overall degradation in the rule of law in the country, while we're seeing rising consumer deaths to, to synthetic opioids uh, in the United States and elsewhere. In, in Latin America and the Caribbean. And so I think that, you know, for China to play a major anti-narcotics role in the region, uh, it doesn't have to look much further than its own shores and start to sort of enforce the the law and and, and also cooperate with the United States on on clamping down on on the export of, of chemicals uh, that are used in the production of synthetic opioids. Well, if you look at the, the numbers, I think last year we had somewhere around 2,000 deaths due to cocaine overdoses in the United States. But the number of deaths due to overdoses of cocaine laced with fentanyl were somewhere over 12,000. And I think what that points to really is that the geography of the drug war as it's waged by the United States is shifting. In Colombia used to be the, the epicenter. Um, with Mexico being largely a transit country. But now, given the preeminent role that's played by, by fentanyl in overdoses and, and deaths in the United States, uh, Mexico has become the single point of failure. And the largest supplier of fentanyl and synthetic opioids and precursor chemicals to Mexico is China. Um, and, and so the, the, the concern on part of the United States has shifted from the northern part of South America and Central America squarely to its closest neighbor. Do you think we're beginning to see the fracturing of South America? 
with some nations allying closely with the United States and their sphere, and others will begin to drift toward China. Is this the beginning of South America dividing down ideological lines? I think to date, the region has been very clear on its, its preference not to have to choose between the United States and China. And if anything, the strategic non-alignment that we've seen beset some major countries in the region in response to Russia's Ukraine invasion is, I'm afraid, a sign of, of the times to come. We may see the region break out into three camps, some US-aligned governments, some China-aligned governments, but I think most of the governments in the region will profess a non-alignment to keep trade and dialogue flowing both north-south and east-west. In economic terms, I don't think the region should really have to choose because diversification of trading partners in, is in the national interest of the countries across the board. However, where values are on the line, be they civil liberties, human rights, transparency, good governance, the people of Latin America and the Caribbean might be forced to decide whether diplomatic or even military alignment or engagement with Beijing is in their best interests. Um, but I think looking forward, if we're to project out a couple of decades, instead of this sort of Cold War dichotomy, I believe that most countries of the region will opt for a foreign policy that's neither subservient nor antagonistic towards the United States or China. Which country in particular do you think China will focus its efforts towards in South America? Yeah, in economic terms, China is going to double down on its investments in the Southern Cone. For most of the countries of the Southern Cone, China is already the number one trading partner. And, you know, I think that the economic opportunities, particularly things like rare earth minerals, um, petroleum, soy, these are all opportun economic opportunities uh, for which the, the countries of the Southern Cone provide enormous economic uh, commercial advantages to to China in terms of diplomatic engagement I think you know the country countries that have decided to chart a course or leaders that have decided to chart a course independent of the United States in recent years are probably ripe for for deeper cooperation or engagement with Beijing and here I would point to a country like El Salvador uh, that's that's you know I, the recent turn of events in El Salvador with the election of President Bukele, who has turned what was once one of the, the United States' closest partners in Latin America and the Caribbean into a populist quasi-authoritarian government that embraces every opportunity to snub the United States and flout the global rules-based order is, you know, a, a real... Uh, frankly, a real opportunity for China. And the fact that President Bukele has doubled down on Bitcoin as a legal tender uh, is, I think, an example of how President Bukele desires to march to the beat of his own drum and pursue an alternative de de development model, perhaps one that doesn't, um, perhaps one that, that aligns with, with Beijing's preferences. And so, you know, I think a new investment commitment on part of, of Chinese firms to develop roads, tourism and sports facilities in El Salvador, commercial infrastructure, a deep water port in La Union, are pilot projects for what stands to be a potentially profitable relationship between Beijing and El Salvador in the future. Um, and I, if anything, I think serves to as an example for what benefits uh, a recognition of a one China policy could confer on other small Central American or Caribbean nations um, that are on the fence as to whether or not uh, you know, they should continue to recognize Taiwan. So I would I would keep a, a lookout uh, for the how the China El Salvador relationship develops in the years to come. Do you think the U.S. will look to reassert itself inside this region, or it will just accept that there will be competition for influence inside its southern backyard? I think the, the Monroe Doctrine points to a traditional policy of the United States to engage in strategic denial of, of extra hemispheric actors and particular extra hemispheric powers from, from engaging in Latin America and the Caribbean. And unfortunately, I, I think that in many ways, China has been given opportunities in Latin America and the Caribbean because of the collective resentment that U.S. policies that began with the Monroe Doctrine have engendered. Uh, and so I think that it's in the United States' best interest 
to recognize where we've come from and where we find ourselves today. And I would encourage policymakers in Washington not to be faddish about the way that the United States government is engaging in Latin America and the Caribbean. We have to be able to offer our partners in the region, you know, foreign policy that recognizes firstly the preeminence of economically and militarily prominent competitors in the region, uh, but also gives the, the region opportunities that China or into a lesser extent Russia cannot provide. But in terms of the United States making its case to Latin America and the Caribbean, I, I think the most critical facilitator of stronger hemispheric relations is frankly going to be Washington's own ability to revive bipartisan consensus on democracy here at home. Doing so will help to boost confidence across the region that democracy is the best form of government and also that the United States is a viable partner, not just because it's a big economy, but also because it's a country that practices what it preaches. So what should the US strategy actually be here? Should they be competing head to head on these projects with China? Well, the US's pools of money aren't endless. And the money spent on roads here means defunding roads in places like the Middle East and Africa. Roads you might need in the future. Do they just allow the Chinese to burrow into the lifeblood of these economies? Well, that's certainly cheaper, and Latin America would have a bunch of new projects, but you're likely going to have to spend four times as much to regain that position when you do need to re-secure your positions inside Latin America. Or do you just throw your carrots away and reacquire Roosevelt's big stick, taking up a highly interventionist position in Latin America once again? Yes, it'll likely put a lid on the problems, but it'll also build up the pressure inside. The students of history will be quick to remind you that the US interventions are what directly led to some of these left-wing governments. This is a decision the US has to make, and has to make soon, because other players are setting up shop in what they feel is their backyard. Thank you so much for tuning into the show this week. We had a bunch of our Patreon events over the last fortnight, and once again, it was an absolute pleasure to catch up with all of you. If you don't want to miss out on our events, or keep up to date with all the articles and everything else we're putting out, you can find everything we're up to, plus more, on our Twitter, Reddit, Instagram, Facebook, Discord, and TikTok on the handle at the Red Lion Pod. Or if you're keen to follow me on Twitter, I'm on the handle at Mike Elliott Oz. Oz is in Australia. This episode is dedicated to friend of the show, Andreas Tjerevic, who is the latest Patreon to sign up as of time of recording. This show would only be possible with the support of listeners like Andreas, who donate a small amount of money each month to help us keep this show going. And we cannot thank him enough. If you feel you can spare a couple of dollars, we greatly appreciate it. So Andreas, this show on Chinese influence in South America is thanks to you. As usual, here are our three book recommendations. The first is Trans-Pacific Revolutionaries, The Chinese Revolution in Latin America by Matthew Rothwell for a look at the Chinese moves in the region. The second is The China Triangle by Kevin P. Gallagher, looking at China's stakes in the resource industry. And the third is The Political Economy of China-Latin America Relations in the New Millennium by this week's guest, Margaret Myers. I want to say thanks to this week's guests, Margaret Myers, Evan Ellis, and Paul Angelo. All three of you were absolutely fantastic to have on the show, and we look forward to having you back in soon. I also want to thank my staff, Wave and Core, the producer, Owen Swift, Perry Grace, Daniela Zavella, Andrew Garbery, and Robbie Sutton, our research assistants and writers, Mark Spencer, our second voiceover artist, Ross Crabtree, our media specialist, Joe Hawthorne, our audio cleaner, Marissa Rafter, our videographer, Nick Much, our field correspondent, as well as Jonah Gunn, our production assistant. These guys really are the best of the best, and the show wouldn't be where it is without them. The Red Line will be back in another fortnight with another international episode. But until then, thank you for listening, and good night. The views and opinions expressed in this episode are solely those of Michael, our guests, and the Red Line podcast. They do not represent any government or organization and are solely our own. For more information, please visit theredlinepodcast.com.